In the second clip on the Inter-American system, I would like to talk about the court on the one hand and on the other hand about the challenges that the Inter-American Human Rights Protection Framework faces. And in fact, I want to start with the latter, because already in the previous video, it has become clear that there is a sort of division within the system. Whereas on the one hand, of course, you have the sort of charter-based or s charter-based protection mechanisms and on the, on the other hand you have the American Convention on Human Rights. And it's not just the procedural complications that come about here and that can be very validly mentioned as one of the challenges, but there's also the fact that this bifurcation basically leads to a kind of two-speed or two-tier human rights protection system depending on which states we are talking about. So looking at this map, we can see that there are 35 state parties to the OAS and therefore also to the American Declaration on Human Rights. But on the other hand, there's the more far-reaching system under the American Convention on Human Rights, which potentially also includes jurisdiction for the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And this has only 22 state parties. So there are additional obligations here as well as a more intricate and arguably also more effective complaint mechanism that includes both the Commission and the Inter-American Court. So to answer the third reading question, in fact, that is one of the main factors driving divergence between the system and divergence more specifically between on the one hand the Anglophone countries which are not part of the American Convention and therefore of the jurisdiction of the American Inter-American Court of Human Rights and on the other hand the Latin speaking countries and this is a very significant divide because it is at the same time therefore cultural and it also has an impact on the institutions per se, which then come to play very little to no role in the Anglosphere and most notably, of course, United States and Canada. That said, let's move on to discuss the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, founded, established in 1979, based in San Jose, Costa Rica, and consisting of seven judges that indeed receive communications, as I've explained, from the American Commission that they then decide on and provide legally binding judgments on. To reiterate this point, looking specifically at the provisions, as I like to do, you know that, Article 61 of the American Convention on Human Rights states that in the first paragraph, only the state parties and the commission shall have the right to submit the case to the court. And in the second one, in order for the court to hear a case, it is necessary that the procedures set forth in Article 48 and 50 shall have been completed. And these procedures, of course, refer to the Commission having looked at this case, having tried to facilitate the settlement, and then eventually referring the case if no such settlement, if no such agreement between the parties, the individual and the state, have come about. The other formal aspect and indeed constraint on the court is of course that it can only look and review the American Convention on Human Rights. Though, as I explained in the previous video, the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man comes in as an important source of interpretation for the provisions that are laid down in the American Convention, but it is the American Convention that is the legal basis for a review of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Taking all of this as a starting point, then the proceedings are legal proceedings. After all, we are confronted here with a court. So we have written briefs, affidavits. We have, of course, witness testimonies. If there is a public hearing, of a case and often there is and of course the court can order provisional measures in order to prevent irreparable harm in the same way that the commission can also do under its various proceedings. One of the most interesting characteristics of the court is though what it can do and what it does when it comes 
to the stage of compensation, so after the judgment has actually been rendered. In the past, the court has really been commended for its very victim-centered and very assertive approach when it comes to human rights protection. And indeed, it's not just that it can award monetary compensation to the victims, which it indeed often does, but it also can ask state parties for structural reforms of its policies in order to forego similar sort of violations to happen in the future. And that is really one of the distinct, distinct features of the Inter-American Court and something that, for instance, the European Court of Human Rights has shied away from doing. And as the textbook explains, the court sometimes even goes further than that and becomes very concrete and creative indeed in the kind of compensation reparation measures that it asks from states. This includes human rights trainings for police officers, the creations of scholarships and funds, so really measures to rectify the injustice that a particular human rights case and violation has revealed. The creative victim-centered reparations on the one hand and the interim provisional measures on the other hand to avoid irreparable harm. Of course, two of the specific procedural devices that I had in mind when asking the second reading question on the characteristics of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. I would add to those two a third one, and that is that the Inter-American Court can issue advisory opinions on the content of legal obligations. And very interestingly, not just on the American Convention on the Human Rights, but also on the obligations that come with other human rights treaties that the state parties, over which the court has jurisdiction, have ratified. That's very interesting because, in a way, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is not actually the human rights body in charge of monitoring those other instruments. Think, for example, of the ICCPR or the CERD. But nonetheless, it has the authority to clarify the obligations on these provisions. Given these various characteristics, you're probably not surprised to hear that some of the most notable challenges in recent years have derived from states trying to curtail the very assertive court and in general to limit the impact of the very progressive inter-American human rights system. This includes attempts to reform the commission most notably, also withdrawals from this system, and in general a lack of funding that states were not particularly eager to fill. And all of this has led then the court most notably to perhaps take a somewhat more cautious approach, a somewhat less adversarial and less pushy approach towards its state parties in order to prevent such a backlash from deteriorating even further. And that's very worrisome, in particular if we also combine it with this notion that there is this two-tier system. So in general, the integrity of the inter-American system of human rights has been quite under stress lately. That being said, it is and remains, without a doubt, one of, the, one of the most progressive regional human rights protection systems that there are. That has obviously also made a tremendous contribution to convergence, not only within the Americas, but also for the human rights protection system more globally. This concludes the videos for this session. I look forward to discussing the topics with you in class.